the inside story on the issues that affect you and your community. This is Local 12 Newsmakers. Good morning and welcome to Local 12 Newsmakers. Now that we are in October, we begin to focus on the higher profile races in this year's election. We begin this morning with a congressional race in Kentucky's 4th Congressional District, which encompasses 24 counties stretching from eastern Kentucky bordering West Virginia through northern Kentucky and stretching downriver to the eastern suburbs of Louisville. The incumbent is Jeff Davis, a Republican who was first elected in 2006 and is now completing his third term in Congress. Mr. Davis serves on the Important Ways and Means Committee. Mr. Davis is a graduate of West Point and served as active duty as a helicopter pilot. Mr. Davis declined our invitation to appear with his opponent this morning, as he did two years ago. I am joined this morning by John Waltz. The Democratic candidate, Mr. Waltz, it, who lives in Florence, is making his first run for public office. He enlisted in the Navy in 2001 and served in both Afghanistan and Iraq. Upon leaving active duty, he returned to Iraq as a civilian vocational instructor, teaching Iraqis to be electricians. He has worked as the executive director of Severus, is that right? Worldwide, which focuses on rebuilding hospitals in conflict zones, particularly in Iraq. John, welcome to Newsmakers. Thank you. Um, you, uh, on your website and other places, have made it clear that putting people back to work, jobs, is your top priority. Democrats have been in the White House, have been, had commanding majorities in both the House and the Senate. What is it that you think you would do and encourage and try to work for if you were in the House that is different than the leadership of the Democratic Party? Well, I mean, I think we have been fortunate to at least stave off, uh, you know, one of the worst recessions we've seen since the Great Depression. But I think there's some unresolved issues uh, still out there that uh, we really need to take care of. Um, you know, we just look at free trade issues, which I've consistently said throughout my campaign. Um, you know, for the last 30 years, due to free trade deals, countries like China and India, et cetera, uh, have an unfair leverage on us. And I think it's really important that uh, we clamp down on those free trade deals, make them fair for every country that's involved so that we can all compete equally. Um, I think also just looking at tax incentives that have gone to companies to ship their jobs overseas is absolutely ludicrous. I think that we have to uh, provide those incentives for new and existing companies um, you know, here in our own country uh, so that we can get this country back to work. So let's talk, uh, there's actually two elements to what you were just saying. I was talking about the China thing right now. Um, what would you concretely urge the United States to do in terms of the trade imbalance with China? Well, I mean, one of the big things is obviously the currency manipulation that they've uh, endeavored in, uh, you know, for a long time. Uh, they're reserving a lot of our cash, uh, which is obviously creating a, a ser serious imbalance. At the other time, there's also, you know, workers' wages, uh, the environmental issues, um, and all facets of what they're doing uh, is, is putting an unfair leverage um, against our country. But in the case of wages in China, actually in the past six months, eight months, there's been a number of reports that wage pressure is forcing wages up in China, and now they're losing some contracts to Vietnam and to other Southeast Asian countries. Is it part of what we're looking at is sort of the natural cycle here that China is a maturing economy and some of this is going to be taken care of by the market? I mean, I think part of it is the uh, maturing, but I think also I think they have taken advantage of the situation as well. Um, a lot of these uh, free trade deals, we haven't really enforced our own rules uh, as well. Uh, we've kind of let them have free reign as far as, you know, the way they compete. And concretely, you know, if you, were, if you were in Congress, what would be a concrete thing that you could introduce and say, this is what we ought to do? Well, I mean, one of the big things is uh, negotiating for fair trade so that, you know, on balance, uh, the workers' wages, there's not a big difference, uh, as well as the environmental impact uh, that they uh, are taking on. Those are some of the big things, and also right now there are in the works for the currency manipulation, but I would continue to strive for that uh, and do everything we can okay. to, to balance it. One of the other big issues that you, this year that is out there in voters' minds is health care reform, mm -hmm. which the Democrats were able to get through. 
Um, but you have been very critical of what the Democrats actually did. You called, if I read this correctly, you called them spineless and they waffled when it came to taking the tough votes. What do you mean by that? Well, I think overall what we've seen in the health care bill is really what they've been working on for years, which is the patient's bill of rights, which is great. It's the access issues, uh, things like that. I mean, there are other parts of that I don't like, uh, such as individual mandates, things like that. Uh, it would have been good to see a, an actual public option involved, um, but overall, like I said, it's, it's one of those things It's better than the status quo, and you know we have to do what we can to improve upon the bill. Well, if you were in Congress, and you've been out on the road campaigning for the last X number of months, uh, is there any energy out there to go in the direction that you're just indicating as opposed to isn't there a lot of talk about people wanting to pull back from what has already been passed? I think uh, unfortunately that's another mark that the Democrats miss is messaging. Uh, Republicans were way out in front of the message uh, as far as what the bill does and you know when we pull apart pieces of the bill and and say this is you know like denying people pre -exist or, uh, insurance for pre-existing conditions you know stopping that from happening people uh, appreciate that it's basically pulling it apart and showing what the bill is going to do uh, when people actually understand and have some knowledge of it I think that's the biggest frustration we're seeing is they're completely confused as to what exactly the bill is going to do. So when you say that um, the individual mandate is something that you have a problem with, meaning the rules that people will have to buy right. their own insurance by 2014. Now we still have time between now and then, so right. is that something you would like to remove f uh, from the plan but then insert the public option? Uh, that's yes. I mean, that's the biggest thing. I mean, right now it's they're going to be squeezed into you know various insurance companies uh, right now, and it's not going to be the best deal for them uh, possibly. But you know, either by having the public option or by removing the mandate or both, I think is the best deal for us. Your opponent, Jeff Davis, serves on the Ways and Means Committee, which is a very powerful committee. It actually he serves on a subcommittee on trade, which is what we were talking about before. Um, how would you evaluate not just the theoretical big issues about Democratic Republican policies, but Jeff Davis? How, what would you say about Jeff Davis's service uh, in Congress over the past six years? I mean, I think he was a rubber stamp for the failed Bush policies that got us here. Um, in the last three months or so, all of a sudden he's gotten involved with a lot of bipartisan things and sponsoring bills. Uh, but frankly, you know, in the last six years, he's not, you know, really helped out with us. I mean, like you said, with the trade committee, uh, he's voted on, you know, various free trade agreements uh, while at the same time voting against measures to provide compensation to individuals that have lost their uh, jobs due to globalization. So I think when we look at it and what uh, is going on with this campaign where you know well over 75 percent of his money comes from corporate lobbyists, I think somebody else is pulling his strings other than the people and I think that's what we need. We need somebody that's actually going to be in there and fight for the people and not for corporate lobbyists. Well, one of the big issues out there for uh, a lot of voters, I mean polls show it all the time, is the sense that the federal government has gotten into uncontrolled spending, spending that puts us into very high debt. As a Democrat, you've indicated that you think public option on the health care might have been a better way to go. Um, would, what's your view on the debt that the federal government has created and what would you do going forward? I think that first of all we have to take responsibility for both sides. I mean, like I said, you know, Bush had his role in it. We've had our role in it as, as trying to get this economy back on its feet. Uh, we've had uh, legislation like pay as you go, which I think is very intelligent, but I think it has to apply to all spending, not just certain parts of spending. And we have to also continually look at what we can do uh, to streamline things, to reform things, uh, you know, such as bulk uh, Medicare, uh, Medicaid uh, prescription uh, buying, you know, saves $200 billion or so on the uh, deficit. I mean, we have to look at different parts of our budget uh, as well as what our spending is and try to do everything we can to be lean and efficient. What about the practical question of um, the Bush tax rollback and what should be done at this point? 
I think it's uh, obviously for the middle class, for 98% of the Americans, uh, it's very wise. Uh, those individuals will put the money back into the economy. Um, what we have to look at is those top 2%, uh, they're more likely to save the money. Um, you know, this has been called trickle-down economics. We've seen it during Reagan's era, we've seen it during Bush's era. During both of those, they were an absolute failure. Um, so the idea that if we increase taxes on the top 2% of Americans, that it's going to, you know, lose jobs and everything else, I think is a complete fallacy. So you would raise the taxes, you would allow the, the rollback to go out of uh, existence on the top 2%. Right. Is that basically people making over uh, 250000 Approximately, yeah. Well, more so, yeah. Uh, and and if, if we look back at Clinton's era when we did have uh, a balanced budget and, and the deficit was taken care of, this was the uh, tax rate that they had at that time. And our economy was rolling. It was, it was boom. It You've was also booming. called for the United States to be more aggressive in the energy area, yes. uh, alternative energy. You're running for a seat to represent Kentucky, which has a large coal industry. How do those two things square? Well, see, the thing is, I, I think the, the Democrats, uh, for the most part, have really been trying to chop the knees off of coal. I think that it's also part of uh, the whole solution. Coal to liquids, um, also there's a plant in Greenup that uh, makes briquettes out of uh, sawdust and switchgrass, which when burned with coal, uh, makes it more efficient. But I think that's the thing, is we have to look at China putting $10 million a day into the other uh, side of alternative energy. Uh, whole wind uh, mill farms in Texas made by the Chinese. I mean, the fact is it's here and, and it's starting. And we can either have our head in the sand or you know, we can start investing in it and make this uh, here in, in Kentucky where we've been doing energy for years. Should the federal government have a role in the whole question, which is very hot in eastern Kentucky, about mountaintop removal as a way of getting at, the, at coal and in the process destroying, having tremendous environmental impact? We're, where are you on that? I think mountaintop removal, I think we have to look at the whole issue too. I mean, there's the environmental impacts, but also it's another way uh, to streamline the workforce, use less people to do it. Um, I think we have to really take a look at a hard look at that practice and uh, what we're doing with it. I, I don't completely agree with mountaintop removal, but I think we have to have that, uh, that talk, those talks, you know, with the mining industry, um, as well as, you know, what, it's, what the impact is going to be. Both you and Jeff Davis make a big point very early in anything you read about your military service. How would you evaluate Congressman Davis's uh, role with veterans? I think it's a lot of hot rhetoric, to be quite honest with you. There's uh, you know, the DAV uh, has given him failing grades for a number of years now, as well as the Iraq and Afghanistan Veterans of America, uh, initially voted against the GI Bill, uh, which uh, the other night in the debate he was saying that there were some flaws in it, which in fact was wrong. Um, all the veterans organizations supported the first bill. Um, and also back to the issue um, with the payday lenders. Uh, you know, the Talent Nelson Amendment was going to cap the percentage of interest uh, to 36 percent, um, which he tried to gut that amendment. I think, again, it's all a bunch of hot rhetoric. Um, we actually need somebody in there that's, you know, recently lived uh, and dealt with the VA and has dealt with uh, all the rigmarole that we have to go through uh, to actually fight for our veterans and do everything we can for them. John, thank you for being here. I'm sorry we didn't have uh, your opponent here because it would have made it livelier and more pointed, but uh, look forward to seeing how this turns out on election night. And uh, anybody willing to get into the political world uh, has my uh, thanks. So thanks for getting in there. This is your first run. I hope it's not your last. I appreciate it. Okay. Stay tuned. After the break, we turn to another campaign, but of a very different kind that potentially touches every one of us very personally. So many people whose lives are changed by United Way, either by what they've been given or by what they give. They are your neighbors, the people you work with, celebrate with, raise your children with. I was almost homeless. I couldn't pay my rent. I was too proud to even ask for help because I never had to uh, depend on no one. The Koala program, 
Council on Aging. It's a program that is funded by United Way. I graduated and I was so proud of, of myself. I'm a home health aide. I just want to give back what so many people have gave me. Welcome back. At this time of the year, it is all but impossible to get me to think about anything other than candidates and ballot issues. Every other request to do something on newsmakers is turned down, with one exception, the place of United Way in our community and its annual campaign. This year, the campaign goal is $62,025,000. The proceeds from the campaign provides vital support for over 300 programs in Hamilton, Claremont, and Brown counties. Uh, and Middletown in Ohio, Boone, Campbell, Grant, and Kenton counties in Kentucky, Dearborn, and Ohio counties in Indiana. The campaign will wrap up on October the 29th. To discuss where we stand with the United Way campaign, I am joined this morning by campaign chair David Doherty, the former president and CEO of Convergist, and Christopher Martin, the vice president for development of United Way of, of Greater Cincinnati. Welcome to Newsmakers. Well, thanks for having us, man. And we'll just get the plug right out of the way both of you are graduates of leadership Cincinnati you bet <laughs> which, is no why, question. which is why you're in these positions <laughs> these critical positions okay seriously though um, 62 million dollars plus big goal given the economic situation where do we stand how are we doing well it is tough I mean it's a tough environment to be raising 62 million dollars we knew that when we set the goal we're currently looking at a, uh, a shortfall our, our forecast tells us we potentially could be a million and a half to two million dollars short of that goal. So we're working hard through the end of the campaign here, through the end of uh, October, to try to get more and more folks into the campaign participating. We have a two million dollar match, so any new donor, their money gets matched, or anybody increases their donation, that money gets matched. So we really need to help United Way earn that two million dollars. That's one of the ways to help close that gap. Uh, Chris, there are 300 programs, agencies that are helped. One of the things when you get such a big number like that and you have such a big operation as United Way, it, I think there can be a fear that somehow this is sort of untargeted. But United Way has priorities, right? You have goals that align with other goals in the community in terms of how you use the money that's collected? Absolutely, Dan. Um, the, the work that we're trying to do is focused in three very specific areas, education, income, and health. And it really, if you think about the priorities within, within each of those areas, it's about helping kids enter kindergarten prepared to, to succeed and, and helping our youth succeed in school and in life. And then also helping families achieve financial stability and, and help folks maintain a healthy lifestyle and, and maximum independence. That's the work that we're trying to do in the community. So education and health are the two of those key things. Education, that certainly reflects the efforts of STRIVE uh, from birth through uh, graduation from college into a the job every market. Every child succeeds, success by six. All, all, of all the things. programs focused on early childhood education. You bet. So, Dave, when, when you know this um, focus for years of United Way has been on workplace campaigns, mm -hmm. and you and I were just we were talking just before the place that I work, uh, USA Regional Chamber. Uh, we're going to end our campaign on this today, mm -hmm. and is that a problem in the modern economy? that fewer people work in those large companies mm -hmm. and therefore the ability of United Way to get two people mm -hmm. is is it's problematic for you. Oh it is and actually if you if you look at the data over the last five years the campaign has raised about 62 million dollars each of the last five years but if you look at that in terms of donor count over that same period of time the donors are down 20 percent and that's wow. largely because of the focus on uh, and reliance on big companies and employee campaigns. So a big push this year, again, helped by the match, is to try to get more companies involved in the campaign, more individuals involved in the campaign and contributing, because that's not a sustainable model. We need to get more and broader participation across the community uh, to, and, and get that donor count headed in the, uh, the other direction to, to put the campaign on a much more sustainable and viable base long term. How do you do that? How do you find, I, I ran my own business for a consulting business for 19 years. 
how do you find people like me out there in the community if I'm not part of some big organization? It's, it's not easy. Uh, it's forced us to think very differently about the work that we're doing and how we're doing it, really. It, it, um, whether it's reaching out to those smaller, medium-sized businesses, and, and, and we're doing our very best at that at this stage, uh, to try and reach out to more and more people, but it's also th it's thinking differently about how we reach out to the individual in the community beyond just the, the corporate, uh, the workplace as the channel. It, it really is about how do we think differently and reach. Well, what, one of the things that's been very successful along those lines is the whole Tocqueville Society, mm -hmm. where you give a gift of $10,000, and quite often the, the United Way has been very successful about getting the owner to come as a guest to one of those first Tuesday lunches get that person involved in the campaign and then over time they bring in their company and that group has grown from it was less than 50 not not long ago and with this year's count will be over 800 and so th that's, so that's a great mechanism people, people that, that are give in at Tocqueville, least 10,000 uh, give at least $10,000 and um, you know beyond just obviously the good giving to United Way and the agenda United Way has it's a great way to connect with peers in the community and so the networking uh, effect of it as you come to a first Tuesday lunch and there's typically over 100 people there and so it's it's a great way for uh, for you to get further connected with the with the community. What is United Way and all the agencies that it supports? What are they what are those agencies those programs telling you about the need out in the community? What still you know, are we still in the midst of this economic downturn? Are we still feeling all of those issues? Are things are, are there indications that things are improving? I th what I, well, first of all, what I would tell you is the need is great. A and the bottom line is we have so much work to do in those areas that I talked about before, education, income, and health. So much more work ahead of us. Uh, it's hard work, and we know that. And um, you know, bottom line is we need to continue as a region to find ways to make progress in that because it really does help for the overall health of the region if we make progress in each one of those areas. Well, well I mean, incredibly successful program. Every, uh, every Child Succeeds mm -hmm. um, today is serving about 3,000 families and we know the need is for 9,000. So a third of just in that program alone, and the data from that program is incredibly compelling in terms of the impact that, um, that it's making. Well, you're talking about data. United Way has become much more data driven, oh, and again, I don't know if I, I tell you, I, 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 in this role I've had a chance to get out and visit some of the agencies. I, I tell you, there's a lot of for-profit companies that would benefit from going out and spending time with the way these agencies are being run. They've got metrics, they've got dashboards, they can show you the impact that they're making. It's very, very impressive how well, they're you know, being run. And I think so many people say if not-for-profits just ran like businesses yeah, and, don't <laughs> and don't realize yeah. how much data-driven, evidence-driven this has all become. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's be clear, I think David mentioned it before, but this challenge grant that you have, because I want people to know that sure. they can make a difference here. What is that again and where did it come from? Well, as Dave said, we have a $2 million challenge match and it's for any individual that makes a first time gift to the campaign. The entire amount of their gift will be matched dollar for dollar. And then any individual that made a gift to last year's campaign and increases their gift, the amount of their increase will be matched dollar for dollar. So it's a, a huge opportunity for us. We had a, a group of about roughly 15 uh, individuals and corporations that came together and said this is important we have to find a way to to ask people to step up and get involved and get engaged and and so they made they put the money on the table for us to use that to, to leverage additional people to support the campaign so because, because many of those big companies do recognize that we got to get more folks more other mm -hmm. organizations involved and so to their credit um, you know my old company Convergis, um, Cincinnati Bell, P&G, the you know long list of, of companies here in town as well as foundations and individuals contributed to it. So that's a reflection of the need to expand the model. Yep, right, and, exactly. And whatever. Almost out of time, but what happens between now and October 29th? <laughs> We're going to be working hard trying to get every dollar we possibly can and there's many campaigns that are in flight right now and we're, we're working those hard as well as one of the breakthroughs of this year's campaign. We do have a number of new companies, big companies, that are in the campaign and we're trying to bring all the resources we can to make sure they're example, successful right out of the gates. What would be a new company that hadn't been in in the past? Ah, Omnicare, Pomeroy Computing are two really? big, big companies that um, have agreed to uh, participate in this year's campaign, which is fantastic, fantastic. Right. Well, let's make sure that people know how to give. Uh, to learn more about the campaign and to give online, go to United Way's website at www.uwgc.org. 
Thank you for being here this thank morning, you, and good luck between now and the end of this <laughs> month, you. and uh, get some sleep. <laughs> thank you for making Newsmakers a part of your Sunday morning. Next week, the Ohio 2nd Congressional District and the Hamilton County Auditor's Race that has taken a strange turn. We end with one more story from the United Way video. About two years ago, I was diagnosed with follicular lymphoma. Our children participated in Camp Courage, which is a, a day camp for, uh, through an organization called Cancer Family Care, which is heavily funded by United Way. If I think about how difficult the past two years have been, had we not had um, the support of Cancer Family Care, it would have been so much more difficult. Giving has always been something that's been important to us, and I think now, having been a recipient, we know.